In general, they're, they're rare. Most people who believe in God also believe in believing in God. They think it's just wonderful. But then there's all the people who've lost their faith or never had it in the, in the first place, but who nevertheless, for one reason or another, believe in the belief in God. They think it's really, really important. They, 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 they hope they can recover their belief in God. They try to spread belief in God. So now the question is, how many more? And here, it's almost impossible to say. Why? Because in organized religion, unlike folk religions, every major organized religion has managed to evolve its creeds and its behaviors in such a way that there's almost nothing you could do that would manifest belief in God as opposed to belief in belief in God. What you do if you believe in belief in God is you say you believe in God. And you tithe and you go to church and you pray. That's what you do if you believe in belief in God. So it's become very difficult to say who actually believes in God. Now sometimes this is just very obvious. How many senators and congressmen do you think really believe in God? <laughs> They all say they do. They all do whatever they can to make sure that you think that they believe in God. But come on, we know better. <laughs> now, yeah, there's another case where the switch of platforms hurts us. Doggone it. Well, that's not quite right, this formula. I don't know what it means, but I believe it's true. <laughs> the, Michael's, Michael's, Michael's laptop doesn't have the same font or something. This is actually a sentence in Turkish. And, or it was before, <laughs> Michael's laptop scrambled it a little bit. And it really doesn't make any difference. See, well, here's what I did. I asked a trusted Turkish colleague to give me a true sentence of Turkish and not tell me what it meant. So he did, and I trust him. And I'll bet a thousand dollars it's a true sentence of Turkish. And I have no idea what it means. I have, I have known nothing about what topic it's on. All I know is it's true. So I don't believe it. I just believe that the, the formula, whatever it is, expresses the truth. There's nothing mysterious about being in that circumstance. I've just explained how easy it is to get yourself into that circumstance, if you want to. Sometimes you get into that circumstance, not because you want to, but because you can't, can't do better. Now let's look at another sentence. E equals mc squared. How many of you believe it? <laughs> yeah, I'm right. How many of you really understand it? <laughs> you know, I do pretty well, uh, pretty well. Uh, you know, I know how to do the algebraic manipulations. But I dare say, a physicist here could write a little multiple choice exam for me, a devious, devilish multiple choice exam, where I would betray my incomprehension of some of the fine points of this. That's what good multiple choice exams can do. So I semi-understand this, but I believe it's true. <laughs> now, what a wonderful thing language permits us to do. It permits us to have a division of labor, or rather, you can put it sort of comically by saying, uh, leave the believing to us lay people and leave the understanding to the scientists. Which isn't quite right, because we don't so much believe as just believe that the proposition is true, whatever it is. Our belief in two is more like our belief in one than we might like to admit sometimes, but that's okay. Even within science, it's quite possible for scientists to use a formula every day in their work and you know, not really be in full control of what it means. There's people down the hall that know what it believes. They don't have to. That is a legitimate and acceptable division of labor. By the way, uh, I had a funny experience. I gave a, I gave a version of this talk just a week ago, about a little bit more than a week ago, at Fermi Lab <laughs> outside Chicago. In a room with about this large, you know, 500 of the world's great physicists. 
And I put up E equals MC squared. I say, ah, uh, how many of you believe this? <laughs> well, how many of you understand it? All the hands go up. <laughs> 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 but I had the last laugh because one of the physicists present raised his hand and, and he said, he said, the experimentalists think they understand it, but they don't. Only, only the theoreticians really understand it. <laughs> Making my point. <laughs> but the point is that in religion, this doesn't work. Because in, with religious formula, even the experts claim not to understand. They make, they make even something of a, of a celebration of this. Now, here's a phrase that one often sees. You know, we're not atheists, we all believe in God in our own ways. This is, this is an extremely popular idea. 98% of Americans believe in God. But what does that really mean? Lucy thinks rock is to die for. Desi thinks rock is to die for. Lucy's thinking of rock Hudson, De Desi's thinking of rock music. <laughs> they don't really agree on much of anything here, do they? And the same thing is true about believing in God. The term God has so many different meanings that to claim, well, everybody, well, you know, we're not atheists. It doesn't really mean a thing. Why do people cling to this fantasy? We almost all believe in God. Why is there so much fostering guilt for disbelief? Because this is a very elegant adaptation of organized religions. It spreads very well. The religions that don't have this feature don't spread as well as the ones that do. Nobody had to invent it, but it plays a huge role in fostering, in, in keeping robust the various religious creeds around the world. And here's the one that really bothers me the most. I found this, I took this picture driving up to my farm in Maine. Good without God becomes zero. Very cute, very clever, nice bumper sticker. Hey, it's subtraction, folks. <laughs> yeah. And I think it is the greatest falsehood on the planet. I think if there's one thing I want, you know, I know I am preaching to the choir today, uh, and I'm delighted to be able to do it, but I want to suggest to, to the choir, my brethren, <laughs> that you go out and start spreading the counter meme and resisting the presumption that you can't be good without God, that because you've got religion, you're automatically morally superior to everybody else. I think... Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Do not let that presumption pass unchallenged. I think we simply have to remind people that some of their best friends, some of the people they admire the most, some of the people that are most engaged in this world are atheists and agnostics. And the presumption that somehow believing in God makes you a morally better person is an idea that has no basis in fact whatever and should not be accepted without demurral. You don't have to insist that it's false you just have to insist that nobody knows that. That is not an assumption that you are entitled to in any reasonable discussion. Now, finally, I just want to end with a few other points. Religions are powerful forces in people's lives, and as I said at the outset, they're brilliantly designed. When we understand their design, we can see better what we might do or should do to revise their design to improve them. And in the meantime, what should we do? Since I'm saying that we haven't done the science properly yet, we don't really know enough about it, I, I would be contradicting myself if I now listed a whole bunch of, of uh, uh, policy proposals and said this is what we have to do because policy's got to depend on getting a better, clearer sense of what religions are. But there's one policy proposal that I do put forward in my book and I'm deadly serious about it and I want to spread it as widely as I can. And it's this. We should have more education on world religion in the schools for all children in public and private schools and in homeschooling. We should have a national curriculum on world religions. Now, history, creed, ritual, music, symbols, ethical commands and prohibitions. All of it. And how are we going to produce this curriculum? In collaboration with representatives of the various religious groups to be sure, they get to say what they want 
to be in the curriculum, but we get to look closely and make sure that it included is anything that is manifestly true, historical fact that they might wish weren't true or they might wish not to have known. <laughs> but we're going to allow them to put whatever great things their religions have done, fine. Just, they can't just do that, they've got to include the bad things too. This is going to be factual, not evaluative. It's not going to be proselytizing, it's going to be just facts. Now look, we already do this. We, have, we say, you've got to teach your kid reading, writing, arithmetic, American history. And I think we should also say, and you've got to teach them this curriculum in world religions. As long as you teach them that, you can teach them anything else you want. I'm going to be really libertarian about this. You can indoctrinate your children with any religious doctrines you want as long as you also give them this.